As you know, it's very difficult to find a lot of sources on our pioneer women that's actually written down other than an obituary. And in Nancy's case, I couldn't even find a decent obituary. It's just a death notice in, in their hometown newspaper. But um, so the um, here I am. I'm pulling up my nerve and Frank and Nancy Beats. I had kind of been um, pondering an exhibit or something more for the museum to acknowledge Frank and Nancy Beats to, for their co um, contribu contributions in our community. And so when I was reaching out, trying to think of something to ins inspire me for another newspaper article, I came back to, to them and I found a lot of fascinating things, a few um, articles on Frank, one done by the State Historical Society back in the 1920s. And this article was edited by Orrin G. Libby, so I figure it's reasonably um, trustworthy in its accuracy. Our founder of our UND History Department, Orrin G. Libby. Um, but there was quite a bit, too, in genealogy publications from Ohio. So Frank and Nancy Beats were natives of, of Ohio, the northwestern corner, not so far northwest as Cleveland, but Frank was from Ashtabula County. If you'll move us farther up ahead. This picture, this is a page from a promotional book called Grand Forks Illustrated, and this was published in 1897. I think Frank gets the prize for the greatest mustache Grand Forks has ever seen. <laughs> Um, a lot like Yosemite Sam in a way. Um, Colonel and Mrs. Frank Beats. You know, we had so many colonels in Grand Forks that weren't really colonels. If there were, you wonder how, how were they, how did we manage to have enough people in the infantry with so many colonels? We had Colonel Beats, there was Colonel Arnold who ran the newspaper in Laramore, um, Colonel Lounsbury who founded the newspaper in in Bismarck, the Bismarck Tribune, and uh, Colonel Smith here in Grand Forks, who was the father of Cora Smith, our great suffragist of Grand Forks and member of the first graduating class of UND. Um, see, this is where the oral thing is better than the newspaper because I can just ramble on and I'm not chopping and keeping track of the word count. But this, this is the picture that um, usually seems to appear in any of the uh, pictorial histories of Grand Forks. Um, let's go ahead. Frank Jesse Beats. He was born March 12, 1839 in Ashtabula County, Ohio. He was of German ancestry, so that's the pronunciation of his name. The I-E in German is an E sound. His father, Rodney Beats, was a farmer, but he was also a Campbellite minister. And one article said he was the first Cam Campbellite minister in Ohio. So I didn't know what that was. I had to look it up. Um, the Campbellites, they believed in sort of an ecumenical nature of Christianity. So they wanted all of the churches to just come together and worship God and say all the same prayers and whatever and not get too worked up about the details of being a Presbyterian or a Methodist. I, I'm s suspecting they're probably mostly Protestants, but who knows, maybe, maybe some um, Catholic Campbellites existed. I, I'm not quite sure. Frank Veitz served in the Civil War. He volunteered right away in 1861. He had to get his father's permission at first. His father didn't want him going off to war, but the captain that he was serving under was known to his family. And so long as he was with this captain, then it's his father said it was okay. And this first enlistment term was just a matter of months because if you remember 1861, a lot of the um, soldiers that signed up thought it was gonna be a short conflict that it would be a matter of weeks and we'll take care of those Confederates and everybody will go home. No, that's not what happened. Frank Veets um, enlisted as a private, but he was appointed a first lieutenant by the governor of Ohio. The governor had that um, um, power to make appointments to the officer corps. And so while he wasn't a colonel, he was a first lieutenant. Okay, move ahead. Nancy Beats was born in Madison County, Ohio. That's just a little bit east of, or west of where Frank came from. She married Frank Beats November 30th, 1864, after he left military service. 
So he, when he first went into the army, his um, Company C was sent into West, what is now West Virginia, and the Confederates had t torn up the railroad lines, and so his, his um, company was mainly repairing the railroad damage that was done. Darn this thing. Okay, I'll just hold it here. And um, then from there, they went up to, um, he was under General Buell's command, and they were going towards um, Fort Donelson, but by the time they got there, Ulysses S. Grant had already won the battle and, and gone off, and he wasn't supposed to. He, he took Fort McHenry and just sent off a letter to his superiors, I'll, we're on our way to take Fort Donaldson. It was a little harder than, didn't, didn't go down as quickly as Fort Han McHenry, but it did. And so then Buell's command, including Frank Veets, continued off into Nashville. From Nashville, they were making their way to a place in 1863 called Pittsburgh Landing. And if, if you're a, a fan of Ulysses S. Grant as I am, I've read over 20 biographies, and that's because of the excellent um, um, documentary that was done by the American Experience about 20 years ago. I got chased into the house by mosquitoes and turned on the television, and here it's the American Experience. Oh, great, what's it on? Oh, it's Ulysses S. Grant. I'll find out if he really was a drunk. <laughs> That's all I really remember from Mr. Ingstrom's history class in Red River about specifics about Ulysses S. Grant. But it was a fascinating but, um, documentary, and it led me on to this, this odyssey. So as I'm reading about Frank Veets and his service in the military during the war, he winds up, he's in General Buell's command, and Grant and other generals were frustrated with General Buell because he didn't speed up for anybody. And as his troops are coming down to Pittsburgh Landing to join up with Grant's forces, General Halleck, who is in overall command, has ordered Grant, you will not move, because he's still ticked off about the Fort Donaldson thing. And so Grant is waiting, and Sherman's um, spies come in, and they say that the Confederates are still pretty unorganized, so they're not ready to launch a battle just yet anyway. Well, they were wrong, and early in the morning of the first day of the Battle of Shiloh, the Confederates came in and they threw everything they had, and through the leadership of Grant and other commanders on the field, they managed to hold their ground, but it was a terrible day. Buell's forces, including Veets, are marching down, and they can hear the artillery in the distance, but they don't speed up. They, they arrive near the end of the day, and um, they're there for the cleanup in the morning. And what Veets witnessed by the time he got there, I'm sure it was horrific. Obviously, we have photographs and, and detailed descriptions from the survivors of the battles. But he was, he was there, so he was in some significant action in the Civil War. Shortly after this, he was injured on the field. He was thrown against the pom pommel of his horse and had some sort of a rupture in his lower abdomen, and this caused him to have to uh, leave military service. And he went back to Ohio, and he married Nancy Veets, and a year later had their, their one and only child, Gertrude Veets, who we have a street named after her, Gertrude, Gertrude Avenue in Grand Forks. Can we go forward? So after the Civil War, since he had worked, he went back to work on his fa father's farm, and his father also had a grist mill, so he worked on that which is important later on in, in his life. He understands the workings of, of the machinery for a mill. And he worked in railroad construction. He had that experience in the war when they were rebuilding the B&O Railroad. He worked in Ohio, and then he went west into Kansas and Colorado and wound up in the real Wild West. He left Nancy and Gertrude behind with, with family in Ohio and the, the violence just shocked him. And it was really Dodge City and, and, and the gunfights and everything. So he decided this isn't where he wanted to have his family. He, he worried about his own safety. So he went back to Ohio. And at this time then he read about opportunities in the Red River Valley. He read about the construction, 
commencing on the Northern Pacific Railroad, so he thought maybe it was something that he could do with that. And so he and his family boarded a, sh a ship, a steamship, at Cleveland, Ohio, and made their way through the Great Lakes to Duluth, Minnesota. Um, let's move ahead. Yeah, I like my cartographical skills here. <laughs> I was worried about, since we're being recorded, that if I copy a map off the internet, somebody will see the video and then I'll get zapped for copyright infringement, so. Anyways, they land in Duluth, and the Duluth and St. Paul Railroad was under construction at the time, and they arrived in time for an excursion on what was built up to St. Cloud at that point. So they were able to hitch a ride as far as St. Cloud. And then from St. Cloud, he purchased a wagon and a team of horses, and with his family made their way up to Macaulayville, which is on the Minnesota side opposite of Abercrombie. And at that point, he, there's not a whole lot of settlers around, but he's speaking with everybody along the way to find out about um, land, the quality of the land, where there might be opportunities. And then he finds out that there, he, um, at Georgetown, Minnesota, there's opportunity there for him to work for the Hudson's Bay Fur Company. So that's where he and his family decide to settle. And this is 1870. This is a picture I found, I think it was taken in the 1950s, and this is the warehouse of the Hudson's Bay Company in Georgetown, Minnesota. He also, he, he built, he bought a house from an agent that was working for the fur company there. And then uh, J.S. Trail, Trail County is named after, after him. He met J.S. Trail and agreed to haul lumber from St. Cloud to Georgetown and was paid, I forget how much, per load. But then he used some of that lumber to expand the house that he had built, and he and Nancy operated as a hotel that was capable of accommodating 12 people at a time. And there's, there was a farmer just north of Moorhead um, that he was, there was these speculators coming in. And I don't know if you've seen the movie, um, Dakota, the John Wayne movie from 1940. Well, it's all about the speculation of where is the great, the Northern Pacific Railroad going to cross the Red River? Is it going to be at Fargo? Is it going to be somewhere else? John Wayne's character is, is the guy that's going to make this decision. So all of these speculators and land people are trying to influence him one way or another where this crossing is going to be. And there's this great line in the movie that our visitor senator friends ought to use for promotion because they're, John Wayne's just sitting back like this and they, they're trying to persuade him where they're going, where he should put the thing. And he says, you know, I don't know, how about Grand Forks? <laughs> and it's just like, see, you got it from John Wayne himself back in 1940. But if you ever see, it, it, it's on Turner Classic Movie sometimes, if you see it coming on, it, it's kind of humorous to watch. There's some stereotypical characters that obviously we wouldn't have in a movie today, but it's, it's a fun movie if you're from this area. And Frank Veets was kind of in the middle of that whole mess that was going on. A lot of these speculators were staying at his place at Georgetown and trying to influence the railroad where they should cross the river. So <clears throat> I just told you all this. He bought a house. He expanded it. He purchases the first plow in the Red River Valley. Now, Jim Machorek isn't here, so I could get away with it, but in the Red River Valley on the United States side, because obviously up at Winnipeg, there have been farming activities going on. But he buys a plow, it's called a monitor. And I looked, tried to Google search to get a picture of what this monitor plow looked like. It had a 12 inch blade, and he used it basically for plowing a garden plant, plot to grow some vegetables to store for the winter time. He loaned it to this Norwegian farmer that lived north of Moorhead, so he, he used it as a plow. Um, later, when he comes north to Grand Forks, he loans it to W.C. Nash, the founder of East Grand Forks, and he, with that plow, plows the first ground in East Grand Forks with a plow from Frank Feetz. 
And, and at the same time, he discovers that there's a great demand for cattle up in Winnipeg. So he decides he's going to organize a cattle drive. First, he goes home to Ohio. He takes Nancy and Gertrude and, and leaves them home for a year to visit the grandparents. And he comes back with his brother-in-law, John J. Dow. And with him, with his brother-in-law, they go to the Sauk Valley and purchase a bunch of cattle from the German farmers there. And with sheepdogs, drive these cattle west and north following the stagecoach road. And when they got to Grand Forks, where they parked the cattle and spent the night, was out by where Memorial Park is today, near the, um, between there and the Cooley. So up he went to Winnipeg. He bought the cattle for $25 a head. He sold them for $75 a head. He went back with his brother-in-law, got some more cattle, went up to Winnipeg, made another nice profit. And then after that, the next year, the German farmers in the Sauk Valley said, you know, we can organize our own cattle drive. And so that was the end of Frank Veets in the cattle business. So in 1872, Frank Veets and his family come to Grand Forks. And this is the Northwestern Hotel. It was owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. He's still working for the company. If you look at the picture under the window, it's there on the top in the center. See with the three windows there? And he was the manager of the Northwestern Hotel. Um, on 3rd and Kitson, where J.C. Penney's used to be, the Hudson Bay Company had a mercantile store there also, and so he took over the management of that as well. And then in about 1874-ish, the Hudson's Bay Company decided to take their interests out of the United States. So it says in many of the articles that Frank Veets bought the inventory and then ran the mercantile himself. But one article says he bought the inventory that they did not transfer up to Winnipeg. So it's not like he bought over the entire store, kind of a minor detail, but he did run it successfully. Eventually he, um, well, let's go on to the next, see what I've got. He's the manager of the Northwestern Hotel, and he, build, he builds the first grist mill in North Dakota, which also powers a lumber mill. This was in 1877, and it was on South Third Street between Gertrude Avenue and Franklin Avenue on the, the river side of the road. And the same machinery could grind grain, but he could also switch it over to cut lumber and process lumber. And um, one article says that the best oak trees were on the point. And so they would harvest the oak trees from the point in East Grand Forks, bring them across the river, and he would saw them at his mill. But they also um, processed cottonwood trees and elm trees for shacks. So these early settlers needing a basic shelter, you know, it didn't matter the quality of the lumber. They, they expected it to be uh, not permanent, so he, he was making money that way. Pretty soon, Fort Totten, he signs a contract with Fort Totten to supply lumber for them as well. So he's, he's referred to in 1881 in the Minneapolis Tribune as a great nabob in Grand Forks because of his various businesses and the success that he's having. Can we go ahead? So this is from the um, um, Sanborn map of 1884, and it's not, it's not as clear as I had hoped it would be, but over here on that block, that's the, the Veets Hotel that burned down after the flood, and over here kind of in the middle there, that's where the mill was. And so I was telling Marcia Gunderson about this, like, wow, Frank Veets built the first um, grain mill in North Dakota, that's, that's amazing. And I told her where it was, and Marcia says, you know, during the, when they were building the flood wall, they, came, they found a millstone and asked the Preservation Commission, what should we do about it, this big heavy thing? And they didn't know what to do with it, and so they just left it there. So the dike 
is on top of at least one millstone from the Beats Mill. It's neat, the, the details that stay with us. Let's go. So that was the Veets edition. This is the first edition added to the original town site that was filed by um, Alexander Griggs. The Veets edition, Veets purchased it from John Fadden. John Fadden had actually p purchased it from Sanford Cady. It was Sanford Cady's squatter's claim, it was described. Um, Katie being our first postmaster, who was postmaster in our log cabin post office that we have. He um, entered a partnership with John McElvey, and they built, several, they built several homes in the Veets edition and sell them. They also built, uh, Veets donated the land bordered by Belmont Road, Gertrude Avenue, and Fifth, is that the dimensions surrounding the Presbyterian Church? which used to be the Presbyterian Church. Um, he also, he and um, McElvey built the wood frame church that had a brick facade or a veneer on it. I've got a picture of it coming up. Let's go forward. Oh, wait, wait, the Knights of Pythias, or is it Pythias? Does anybody know? Pythias? That's what I've been saying for years and then I freeze for a minute. What if it's the wrong thing? So the Knights of Pythias organized in Grand Forks. I think this is pretty much the first sort of um, fraternal club that we have in Grand Forks. And the, the story of Pythias, he and his good friend was captured by the king and, and the king was gonna execute his friend and he says, but first, I'll, I'll be your hostage, let him go home and settle his affairs and he says, well, Aren't you afraid that he'll never come back? Oh no, he, he'll, he's my friend, he'll, and he, the friend comes back, and it's a, a brotherhood, really, what it is, so. Let's. Oh, well I just kind of jumped back over to this. The Beats Hotel, and I took this from a walking tour that was put together by the Preservation Commission back in the 80s, because I couldn't find another picture of the darn house. I looked all over the place. But if you'll remember, this, it, was, it became the Hall Apartments. It was at one time called the Richardson House. Uh, Veets built it as one side or the other was originally just his house. It was built in 1876. In 1877, he expanded it and made it larger. And this, he wanted to be able to have a hotel accommodating people on that south part of Third Street. And there he is again. Colonel Frank Beats, the colonel who wasn't a colonel. But it's a, it's a sign of respect, I guess. Let's go ahead. All right, so here, this is a page from another one of our, press, our um, books of uh, promoting ground forks. This is St. Michael's Church. That's Baptist Church. This is the first Methodist Church. Up there in that corner, that's the Presbyterian Church that Veets and Maple V built. Here, see the, um, the former Christian Science Church? It used to have beautiful domes on it. And I'm not quite sure. I think that's maybe St. Paul's Episcopal. Okay. The Knights of Pythias Band. So when the Knights of Pythias decided to organize, and this is the later 1870s, Frank Veets joined. A lot of people joined. They were all pretty excited about joining. Another interesting thing about the Knights of Pythias, it started in Washington, D.C., 1868, I believe, and they actually got their charter from the U.S. Congress. They're the only organization, I guess, that has done that. But Frank Veets eagerly joined, and he donated $350 for their first set of instruments. So that's our, our first band of Grand Forks. This particular picture is from an 1897 pr promotional book. So I, I don't know if these guys are the original band players, but it's a great picture. Minto. For some reason, about 1882, Veets decides to move to Minto. Maybe it's, maybe it's a new frontier or something like that, new opportunities. Maybe he was just sort of a restless sort, I don't know. But he buys a, a 
160 acre farm right on the edge next to the railroad track. He builds another grist mill, the first mill in Minto. And his son-in-law, by this time Gertrude, their daughter, has grown up. She went to school in Faribault, Minnesota and met and married Moses Star Titus, who is the brother of Seymour Star Titus, who founded the bank that became First National Bank and is now the Alaris. Um, Moses Star Titus was a banker of the Bank of Minto. And after Frank, Frank stayed in Minto maybe six years or so, he still had some business interests here in Grand Forks, but then he kind of turned the farm over to his son and da daughter and son-in-law and came back to town. So a brief, but yeah, Minto, like, you know, Grand Forks, we have various transportation links and everything, and there's the Red River. Minto, not meaning any disrespect, but it's a lot smaller. But the main reason for him to return to Grand Forks is the Dakota Hotel. And this is actually, this is a picture by the architects before it was built. Um, the Dakota Hotel, the first one built in 1888 by a collection of entrepreneurs. Um, 18... 93 is when Frank Vietz and his brother-in-law, John Dow, take over the management. And about 1887, there is an article in the newspaper saying that they had replaced all the furnishings in the Dakota Hotel. So they're leasing the building and running the hotel, but Vietz actually owns all of the furnishings, Vietz and Dow, his brother-in-law. Oh, I'm kind of jumping ahead. This is his gravestone back in, in Ohio. We can move on from that, but it's, it gives his um, rank, first lieutenant, com uh, battalion, company C. It was built, yes, Dakota, six stories high. And the problem is, the fire department could handle their, their equipment, could shoot water two stories high. This, this isn't going to end well. Let's go forward. Disaster. So this was 1897. 1897 was a bad year for fires. Before this fire, the syndicate block, which was our first business block in Grand Forks, it burned down. Sadly, there was a, a, an older couple that they survived the syndicate block fire. He was, I forget their names, the man was a Civil War veteran and had a disability and his wife. And so they got out of the syndicate block and had to find a new place to live. They moved into the Dakota Hotel. And when the fire was burning and there, the Grand Forks Herald had a really excellent article the next day ex describing the fire and where the smoke was discovered in the, the next building over the Nash warehouse and there was no firewall and it spread into the Hotel Dakota. Um, another article I read more recently was saying that the, the fire escape, people from the top floor climbing down this metal fire escape, it must have been hot to hold on to. Most of the people got out, but not the Civil War veteran and his wife. And people, the, the smoke was so thick, you, you just had to try and save yourselves. But she was heard screaming, someone please help my husband. Um, so, and I mentioned the furnishings were owned by Vietz and Dow. And it was well over $200,000 of a loss. And she, he still had other money in all of this, but this was a big hit to him. It was reported even in his hometown newspaper back in Ashtabula that, that this was a disaster. And so he picks up, and after this he leaves Grand Forks. He goes up to British Columbia and buys a gold mine, or buys a interest in a gold mine. Anyways, he, he's not really panning for gold, it's, it's a mine. And he does make money from this venture, but it was noted when he returned to the States 
that the experience had physically aged him, it was noticeable. He went back into the hotel business, not in Grand Forks, but in Michigan. And all of this time, he owns his family farm back at Ashtabula. So he and, and Nancy go to Ashtabula, and Nancy passes away in around 1910. And if I can get this well enough to read, the reason I included her in my title is that she was well respected and admired and loved here in Grand Forks. The references to her do mention that she had a charitable nature, that she was always willing to help the, the needy and the sick. Um, when they're t um, talking about the early character of the city of Grand Forks, H.V. Arnold, who wrote a early um, sort of county history, wrote of, of um, the reason Grand Forks had such moral character was because of its ladies. And he specifically names Nancy Beats and Mrs. Griggs and, I'm sorry, I forget the third lady. But anyways, um, Mrs. Beats and Mrs. Griggs organized the first Sunday school for children in Grand Forks. And this, this thing with his father being a Carmelite, with the ecumenical nat nature of everything, they help the Vietzes help organize the first Methodist church, but then they also donate land to build the Presbyterian church. So his dad's attitudes of religion seem to have also passed on with him. But when news reaches Grand Forks that Nancy Vietz has passed away, the city council passed a resolution. January 3rd, 1910 meeting of the Grand Forks City Council. Held Monday, January 3rd at 8 o'clock p.m., Mayor Taylor presiding and present Alderman Wheeler, Griffith, Sanus, Salisbury, Kent, Dixon, Ryan, Buckingham, Hunter, Vallely, Sorley and Ellisted. Alderman Wheeler, Henry Wheeler, of Jesse James fame, seconded by Alderman Sorley, offered the following resolution for adoption. Whereas, for the public press has brought news of the death at Ashtabula, Ohio, of Mrs. Frank Veets, formerly of the city, and whereas Mrs. Veets was one of the first white women to establish a residence in the territory that is now the state of North Dakota, and she, together with her husband, Honorable Frank Veets, were of the very earliest settlers in the city of Grand Forks, having located here when the whole of the city was windswept prairie, and here maintained their residence for many years so that her social graces, warm-hearted friendships, and her Christian charity were known and appreciated by the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the old and the young of our then young city, and are yet, notwithstanding their long absence from us, remembered in the grateful hearts of their old-time friends. Now, therefore, they know how to make a res resolution. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and city council of the city of Grand Forks, North Dakota, in council assembled, do hereby express to the surviving husband, Honorable Frank Veets, and to her daughter, Mrs. Gertrude Titus, our deepest sympathy in the great loss that they have sustained. And we desire hereby to spread in a formal manner upon the official records of our city this resolution as a tribute to one whose gracious presence left a deep and permanent impact upon the home life of our city. J.D. Taylor, Mayor, attest W.H. Oh, that's, that's the end. J.D. Taylor, Mayor. So I don't know how many other times a housewife really has been noticed in recognized in the city records as Mrs. Frank Frank Vietz was. But I think I'm, there might be one more slide, Marsha. 
Dakota fire. Yep, I already did that. So, um, does anybody have any questions? No? Um, Gertrude Vietz and her husband had two daughters and their names were Lulu and her no was Lulu somebody else. Lulu is, is a relative in there and we ha also have a street named after her. Um, Lois Benner was a cousin of them because her grandfather was S.S. Seymour, S.S. Titus. And she would, Lois was one of our craft ladies, or members of our craft guild. I call them the craft ladies, but she used to love to make reference to Grandfather Titus from time to time, or sometimes she'd re talk to about um, Gertrude Vietz, her relative. But I don't think there's anybody here in town anymore. Gertrude and her husband, they, they lived in Minto until he retired and then probably moved to California. I know S.S. Titus moved to Pasadena, California, and his next door neighbor was Tom Campbell, who was born in our Campbell house. And, and Lois Benner would also talk about that. When we would visit Grandfather Titus, she would also, she would play with Tom Campbell's daughters next door, Elizabeth and, and the others, so. There was a connection there. Yes? The uh, alternate swirly that you mentioned in, in the uh, uh, combination is the uh, is Arthur Sorley of the Sorley Bridge. Uh, I was wondering, do you know, uh, of course they don't call them aldermen anymore, they're councilmen. Do, do you know much about the city council back uh, then? I know uh, Sorley, he served four years in this city council. Uh, or Chris, it wasn't called the council then, was it? Uh, no, they were aldermen. East Grand Forks, my grandfather was an alderman in East Grand Forks. I guess we're just more modern, maybe, with council. I don't know. So they're, they're, now there are only seven, but then there were part, what, there were 10 or 12? Or? Well, let's see. The council of Monday, mayor presiding, prominent alderman Wheeler, Griffith, Sanus, Salisbury, Kent, Dixon, Ryan, Buckingham, Hunter, Vallali, there's 12. Counts, um, Alderman Hunter, he's the father of Alice Hunter, of sort of infamous fame. He was, he was a banker, he had all sorts of farmland. He was involved in, in the brick making. I had mention of him when I did my article about the brick factory. Um, another thing, one of the articles referring to Frank Vietz says that he recruited John Bartholomew to come to Grand Forks to start a brick factory. And I did know that Bartholomew's first brick factory was in the, that corner off of um, Fourth, just off of Reeds, where there's that triangle and there's the flower garden there. There was a brickyard there and it was by Bartholomew. He got that land from Vietz, but I don't, hadn't seen any reference in my ref, um, research on the Bartholomew Brickyard really mentioning Vietz other than this one location. Um, Bartholomew was reported in his hometown paper, they were both Ohioans, but he wasn't from the same town as Vietz. When he, Bartholomew left to start in the brick business in the Red River Valley, he started out at Crookston or his intent was to start out at Crookston, and maybe he met Frank Vietz there and was persuaded to come to Grand Forks instead. That's just a speculation, but I had wondered about it at the time. It says in the newspaper in April that he's going to Crookston, and then in May it's reported that he has decided to stay in Grand Forks. So, and, and then with my Brickyard article, the main point of it was just to kind of get people to stop and think, about that depression that we drive through on Belmont Road. Now when I drive to work, I go down Walnut more. I just got a habit of driving through the brickyard. Uh, one lady sent me a, a comment on a Facebook page saying that her mother lived in the 1600 block of Chestnut 
and when they were digging out the ground to plant flowers, <laughs> they ran into all these bricks. Well, that's, that's why. But I digress. Yes? Uh, the Diddy Brothers, I have one I can show you in a little bit. Uh, J-D-B-R-O-S, John and James Dinney. And their brick factory, that was the photograph that went with my Herald story, if you happen to see it. And it's, what I like about that photograph is it's from, the Diddy Brothers brickyard was just east of the Ray Richards golf course. And so they're, the picture of the brickyard, but in the background, the railroad tracks and Old Main. So you can see uni the university in the back. That's, those kind of pictures are cool because it kind of, you know, brings, brings it together a context. Well, all right, thank you for coming and putting up with me. Have another cup of coffee. <laughs>